Welcome, Vic. It is great to chat with you again. And you and I do go back a ways. Um, we started working together back with Advanced Tactics, which was your first game for Matrix Games and continued on through some of the early Decisive Campaigns games. And while we're not working on this project together, I have to say I've been very impressed with your recent work, uh, as well as what's coming up. What we're going to talk about today, which is Decisive Campaigns, the Ardennes Offensive. And uh, I'm glad we're going to have this chance to talk about this upcoming game with our audience as well. So I'm going to start with a brief summary of where you've been, and then we're going to talk about where you're going. Sure. Uh, Decisive Campaigns, Ardennes Offensive is the fourth game in the Decisive Campaigns series of war games. And you've explored the campaigns of the early Blitzkrieg, the first two years of the Eastern Front, and looking back at these games, I think it can be fairly said that you've been recognized as an innovator in game design and development. Uh, and that shows in your last two published games and also the very positive reviews they've garnered among wargamers. And Decisive Campaign's Barbarossa, which was your second to last game, explored the challenging priorities and the ethical conflicts of high command on the Eastern Front, adding a level of role playing and immersiveness to computer war games that I believe will continue to influence other designers for years to come. And then Shadow Empire, which is currently available on Matrix Games and should be released on Steam, I believe the day this interview airs, also blends different game elements from wargaming, forex gaming, procedural content generation, and role playing games. And it creates a very immersive and re very replayable post apocalyptic, pardon me, science fiction game where it really feels like all of your decisions matter as far as the destiny of the people you lead. So before we get into the details of the upcoming Ardennes Offensive, could you please speak a bit about the development and design journey that you've been on uh, through the previous Decisive Campaigns titles and Shadow Empire? Oh, hi there, Eric. <laughs> that was a long intro. Yeah. <laughs> um, sure, yeah. Um, as you already mentioned, we go back a long way. Uh, I joined Matrix around 2004. Um, and that was Advanced Tactics, and I think 2009 or 2010 was probably the first decisive campaigns title, which rolled directly out of uh, a, a desire to do something more historical, uh, because Advanced Tactics was very procedural uh, and, in a sense, very generic. So I wanted to have the nitty gritty of the feel of real history uh, and the, the 16th Panzer Division in the hex it's supposed to be with real equipment and not something called light or medium tanks. And this, this desire to, um, to work on real history and uh, to simulate the real history, uh, it's sort of a red line in, in, my, in the last 15, 20 years I did video game development. I always go, either to, I need to do some history, or I go to, oh my God, I really need, you know, the freedom uh, of procedural design. Uh, I want to be surprised myself. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to press the button start and have a, have a new planet, a new world, something that will surprise me. Um, and I've always been switching around from one to the other. I can, if I work a few years on one, I get fed up and go to the other and vice versa. This time I've been trying to do both at the same time, uh, which has been quite a workload, but um, Shadow Empire has already been released on Matrix in June and will release probably, if this interview is aired, when I think it will be aired, will be released today. Uh, and the size of Campaigns 4 has been in the works uh, for over two years now, I think. Um, and I hope to switch my full attention to this title after the release on Steam of Shadow Empire and initial support work. Extra clients always means some extra support work. Well, I think that throughout all your titles, you've actually, mentioning the support work side, you've actually engaged with the customers and with the audience a great deal. And I know that that is appreciated. And that also is one of the key elements to um, the loyalty a lot of customers have to your games. Um, 
But let's talk for a moment about decisive campaigns or Den's offensive itself. So on this one, compared to the previous decisive camp campaigns titles, you decided on a change in focus and scope. And this time you moved to the lower end of the operational scale of war games, where the main unit of maneuver is the battalion. And you've tried to create some new innovations here at this scale. And on the one hand, from what I've seen, you're going back to some core wargaming concepts. But on the other hand, you're also really trying to bring the battlefield alive. And you're adding a lot of uh, historical choices focused around movement, combat, and logistics at this scale. So for someone who has played other war games, either the previous decisive campaigns games um, or others at the operational scale, what would be your elevator pitch, so to speak, your quick summary of why they should be excited about the upcoming decisive campaigns or Den's offensive? I hate elevator pitches. Uh, <laughs> but, but seriously, in short, I think it's the most fun uh, decisive campaigns game I did so far. Mm -hmm. It actually, I've been enjoying myself the most playing this uh, mm -hmm. version of uh, decisive campaigns. Um, there's something um, that just works well with the designers. I did it this time. Uh, and I guess it has to do, as you said already, with the skill. Uh, we introduced a lot of new rules, including uh, intercept fire, for example. And there's a there's a constant tension if I play Decisive Campaigns 4. Um, around every corner, there might be an enemy unit hiding, which can actually mm -hmm. immediately fire upon you if there's a line of sight. Um, and it brings the the, 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 the the tension of like what you usually see in more tactical war games mm -hmm. to the operational uh, level. Uh, and I'm very happy with this. And this was not at all an elevator pitch. The elevator pitch is, uh, it's the most fun besides the campaigns game so far. I actually think the part about, you know, it brings some of the tension of the tactical scale to the operational scale is a heck of an elevator pitch too. And that's what I was seeing too. I have to say, when I was playing through the beta version, uh, it struck me, and I've read many accounts of actual warfare on the Eastern Front, on the Western Front, uh, in the Pacific, and there's always, even at the operational level, this fog of war relating to where the enemy is. And, oh my gosh, how did that unit of enemy get behind our lines? And what are they doing in the village behind us? Or how did they get a roadblock over there? Or have we been encircled on this side? Or do we have enough reconnaissance over there? Do we really know the front there is free of the enemy? And I had some of that same experience, you know, playing with our Dens offensive and in a way that I haven't really had with a lot of other operational war games. So I think you're spot on there. Um, and so let's get into some of those details. Uh, to talk through the the features and the improvements. Um, so starting with the setting, of course, with the, with the Battle of the Bulge, but talk about your decisions about the scale and the scope and some of the choices you made about the uh, both the the map and time scale, the unit scale, uh, how right. you're handling the map and the elevations. Before I start, I, sh I shoot... I should mention that I'm doing this game to, together with uh, David Cambina from mm -hmm. Italy. And he's uh, taking care of uh, the big, big brand of scenario design mm -hmm. and compiling the orders of battle, tables of organization and equipment, etc. So I have my hands free to focus on the actual game design, mm -hmm. uh, which is good and bad at the same time. I like to do this research myself, but David is really good at it. Uh, and as you know, Barbarossa, I did together with Cameron Harris. Right. Right. And we have a completely different, uh, I have a completely different partner here with uh, this Eisen campaigns for uh, completely different strengths uh, compared to, to Cameron Harris, who, who brought a lot of innovation with like role playing game aspects uh, to Barbarossa. And here with David, we're really like trying to go back to the core of hex and counter wargaming. And there's no there's no role playing aspects. Right. And there's officers and 
and, and they have cards and stuff, but it's very minor compared to Barbarossa or Shadow Empire. Um, so, so the focus is really on how to make a core hex counter game here and do it as good as I can. Um, so for your question, uh, the skill is uh, one hex is one kilometer. Uh, the units are almost all at battalion size, uh, which means that the division consists of roughly about 12 to, to 12 to 16 units or sometimes even more. Um, the turn time is approximately approximately six hours uh, per turn, which gives us four, four turns per day, which means, for example, that the monster scenario, because there's one big monster scenario, at least one big monster scenario that's going to be in there, the full Ardennes campaign on battalion level uh, for 16 days. Uh, so the biggest thing you're going to have is like a, about a 200 by 180 hex map uh, with a lot of units and 64 turns. Uh, but luckily, we decided to also provide quite a number of uh, medium and small size scenarios, which are especially uh, well adapted, I believe, to play by email play. Uh, and a lot of fun, also against AI, but I, I always prefer to play humans myself. So um, I, I like games that end in eight or 12 turns because, you know, like 64 turns, it's just too much, especially in beta testing. Um, well, it never definitely helps to have those scenarios for for testing, and that, those are the ones I've been tinkering around with too, is the smaller ones. But but even that big campaign, I mean, first off, that's going to be very appealing to a lot of war gamers. But that doesn't sound unmanageable. That sounds, you know, sixty four turns is is not that bad, honestly. No, it's not unmanageable, but it's it's I consider it a monster scenario. Mm -hmm. It's big. Yeah, uh, I think it's going to scratch the monster itch. Yeah, uh, it's going to take you half an hour to. 20, 25 half an hour, 25 minutes half an hour at least to to, to move all your units. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're playing the Germans. I think mm -hmm. it'll be quicker if you're playing the Americans, especially at the start of the offensive, right? Because they're, they're quite, the line is quite weak. All their reinforcements are arriving in the, yeah. the days that come after. Uh, but the Germans, they have amassed a rather serious order of battle uh, on that little piece of uh, front line over there in the Ardennes. Uh, but I think, you know, there's different kind of players. Some people like monster scenarios. Some people like small scenarios. So we're trying to cater to everybody. Yeah. And we have included this super duper, excuse me for the word. Uh, that sounds a bit old fashioned. Super duper. Uh, a very good scenario editor. Because mm -hmm. all previous decisive campaigns games, they didn't have a good scenario editor. Nobody managed to make... Almost nobody managed to make scenarios for those games just because it was too complicated. So it's been completely revamped and it's not easy to use. I think that's so, very exciting, actually. Because I'm I mean, expecting. I, I, yeah. Shoot. No, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm expecting to see quite a number of scenarios uh, because there's many uh, battles to model. Mm -hmm. uh, in the, like the, I mean, uh, well, I think I think that I think the battalion scale, all this. I think first off, the scale and scope that you've chosen, I think, is is very well chosen, combined with the features that you've implemented, which we'll go into more detail about in a sec. Because I think it really contributes to making this more dynamic, more tense operational scale battle work, and I think it also opens up to a wider possibility of scenarios, some of which haven't been done in previous operational scale games that tended to be more at the regimental brigade, you know, division scale. So I, I, I'm with you. I think it's exciting. I think there are going to be a lot of scenarios uh, made for this that we haven't seen before. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's what I wanted to say. Let's, let's talk a little bit more about some of the other features for war gamers to help understand. So we have this idea of no hex ownership. Uh, which leads to reconnaissance and infiltration tactics. Um, can you talk about that for a minute? 
Yeah, it's been a big change uh, engine-wise because all the other titles, including Shadow Empire, uh, they all have hex ownership. Every hex is owned by somebody. And if you own a hex, you have full uh, reconnaissance on that hex. Mm-hmm. And, and we dropped that completely in Ardennes. And now there's a few hexes you can own, but mm-hmm. these can be towns of a certain size mm-hmm. uh, or supply depots or supply sources. But that's about maybe one hex in a, on average, one hex in 100, one hex in 200, and all the others. They do not have ownership. So if there's a part of the map, you have no units. You have no idea what's going on. It should still be yours, right? But a few turns later, are you still so sure if you didn't send any, any garrison unit over there? Not, right. any, not a single Jeep to just take a look if everything is still cool over there. And I, 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 I like it. It feels more like a... She was less gamey in a way to mm-hmm. to have done away with hex ownership. Um, I agree. I think it works very well. Uh, and you still got choices as a player when it comes to reconnaissance, both on the ground and in the air. So if you really decide to leave an area uh, full of fog of war, that's your choice, and you may pay the price for that a turn or two later. Um, and there's also, again, in in this dynamic battlefield that you've created here, there's also with the one kilometer per hex scale, there's interception and interdiction fire um, as units are moving around. And we're talking about, in some cases, uh, even what would be considered direct fire, right? Yeah, actually, the, the engine distinguishes uh, in indirect fire and direct fire. Mm-hmm. And for direct fire to be efficient, uh, we're not talking about range here because the ranges are always quite short. Mm-hmm. This is one kilometer. So, uh, but with direct fire, the unit that's firing has to have a good line of sight on its actual target. Mm-hmm. While with indirect fire, it's quite different. Uh, with indirect fire, basically, a unit needs to have a good line of sight on the target, or maybe multiple units together. Mm-hmm. Uh, they can radio the coordinates over. To the actual artillery unit or mortar unit was doing the firing. Um, so you can actually use units as spotters. There's some interest here to maybe occupy a, a nice hilltop, which has a good view in the valley below, just to coordinate artillery fire and to hamper enemy movement. Maybe if it's not very deadly, uh, if the Germans are moving through a valley, the Americans have a good look on the road in this valley. Uh, then while, while the Germans are moving in their turn, they will receive intercept fire from artillery and they will lose action points during this. So it's, it's one of the interesting, there's many interesting uh, situations that can arise uh, out of the rule set uh, as we compile it this time. Mm-hmm. And there's also this concept now, you've, you've got two other areas where you've built in on a lot more detail in the choices a player has for their units. One is in how they move and fight. So you've got this idea of march versus combat modes. And then if they're actually fighting and they're choosing to attack, you've got a much more detailed combat system, including different choices of attack intensities. Could you talk about those a bit? Allowing the player to choose to go to march mode, he actually doubles uh, the range of his unit. Uh, And this way you can move units from, I don't know, from the north of the map to the south of the map at uh, uh, more or less historical speed. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, while at the actual front line, you will not see any units in march mode. Mm-hmm. It, it, you, you can try, but it will not be very clever because if a unit is in march mode and it finds itself in intercept fire or in combat, it will yeah. suffer a big penalty because it's not deployed for battle. Um, so this way, there's like different rates of movement on the front line and just behind. And together, it, it's a, it, of course, it's a compromise, but it works, I think. Um, so you get the historical feel of combat at this scale and uh, the movement ranges uh, that correspond with history at the same time. But basically there, yeah, um, 
I just because recon is very important. So I also wanted to add like an aggressive uh, way to do recon for the player uh, because maybe you don't have any airplanes to do a recon mission on a certain area of hexes or a certain hex. Uh, or maybe you do not have uh, another like recon unit you could move up to get more recon points on uh, set hex. And in this case, you can just use one of your, your combat units, attack the hex in question, but attack it as a probe or a recon in force. And this way you will not suffer many casualties, but you'll get many recon points on the hex. Um, and what, when I did that, I thought like, well, if we're adding attack modes anyway, let's let's go also for the option to go for an all-out attack, uh, which is sort of comparable to how, for example, the SS forces in the Odense Offensive in the, in the north, uh, how they attacked at the beginning of the offensive, uh, almost like the, like the Russians. Uh, you know the Russian Ura attack, right? They, right. they they scream something to give courage to the troops, and then they all they all assault. Hey, diddle diddle, yeah. straight up the middle, right? <laughs> and and this usually this does not go very well, but it can go well um, uh, if you have a lot of troops to spare and you really want to take a hex. Right. So basically, it 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 it, it gives you more more combat uh, punch but at the price of more casualties. Um, Let's also discuss supply and logistics. So this is something that I think a lot of play war gamers at any scale are interested in, but especially at the operational scale. So how does the supply system and the logistics system at this scale work? What are the basics of it? If I go for the simple explanation, there's two special hexes you need to keep an eye on. First, uh, you need to keep an eye on your supply sources, which are basically uh, which, which basically simulate off-map uh, piles of oil mm -hmm. and, and ammunitions. Um, these, uh, these these supply sources they send uh, their supplies to all the units on the map. Uh, you can activate a, activate a special supply layer. Uh, to see what the range is of a specific supply source. And if something is in a range, it will receive a certain percentage of supplies depending on the range. Um, and there's also supply bases. Uh, these supply bases, they, they can act in two different uh, roles. First one is that they actually act in the role of helping the supply source to reach further. Uh, to extend the range of the supply source. Uh, and the second one is that they can themselves directly uh, feed units in a limited range around them. Uh, why this, this double function? Well, basically, the, but the real reason I did it uh, initially was because well, for the Germans to succeed, they depended a lot on actually capturing uh, American supply bases. Where they were short on oil, especially. Um, so to properly simulate this in the game and to give the Germans a chance to, to, to do what they historically didn't succeed in very well, uh, I added these supply bases. Uh, because if you capture one, you cap capture the oil as well. Uh, and then the Germans can immediately resupply their panzers around that, that supply base. Um, but you have to choose. Either you, you consume it or you use it to, to extend the range of your supply sources. One of the things you mentioned uh, in some of your notes to me also was the traffic congestion was now modeled. Right. Well, many things are modeled now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I try to focus completely just on the hex and counter rules and don't do anything. Mm -hmm. Just add all the stuff that I would like to see in an Ardent game. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing that had to be in there is traffic congestion because if something, well, a couple of things thwarted the Germans uh, eventually, 
uh, American air power for sure, uh, but also the lack of a, of, a, of a good road network in the area of operations. Um, so uh, what happens uh, in, in, in DC or dense is if you move your, for example, your pencil division over say like a major road, like a, like a, one of the, the sealed roads going to Saint Feet, uh, there will probably be a little bit of traffic congestion. Uh, and this traffic congestion uh, will make it cost more to move units over this road. So basically your whole division will slow down a bit. But here we're talking about a good road. And usually this is not going to happen because the Americans know this and they try to, to keep these roads uh, blocked, at least at some point. So also German units, especially because there's so many, they're taking like secondary roads, dirt roads. And these, these are horrible roads. And there, like if you try to move a division over a dirt road, you will very quickly see major uh, traffic yeah. congestion penalties. And there's not much the Germans can do about this. It's sort of like something they have to live with. Uh, either, either get the good roads open or... Yeah, you got to take best stone, right? And get all the good roads uh, if you exactly. actually want to have a supply net. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, so let me let me go over. It's a, is a yeah. very hard operation. Mm -hmm. So let me go over a few more of the features. I, I know um, we don't have much time left, so let me go through a few more of the features and ask if you want to make any specific comments on them. Uh, I know there is a more detailed weather system uh, that has weather very appropriate to the fighting in the Ardennes. There are some very nice new map uh, and unit graphics, which we'll show some screenshots of. There are some improvements to the AI. Um, do you want to comment on any of those in specific? Um, <clears throat> I went a bit overboard with uh, graphically modeling the, the different types of weather. Uh, but I don't know. I liked it. Uh, I felt it was sort of a detail that was, I don't know, it was important for me at this scale to. Mm -hmm to show the, the ground conditions properly in the, in the map graphics. Uh, I'm not sure, but I think there's actually six different conditions, six, six different graphic sets for the... Uh, it looks great, I have to say. Access now. Uh, so, I don't know, it gives a sense of, of for me, a sense of, of, of being there. Uh, mm -hmm. And maybe I went overboard. What do you think? No, I think I think that's true. And uh, some people, I think, who maybe haven't gotten into the uh, battle for the Ardennes uh, to a great deal, might have this image, sort of perhaps from from movies and such, that it, they were fighting in the middle of a blizzard with, with lots of tons of snow. But really, all these conditions that you described, they really went through all those conditions at various parts of the Battle of the Bulge. So I think it's good to see those modeled. So. If I can summarize this, then when we look at all the operational war games that have been made to date for the computer, I think this stacks up very well. And from my own play experience with the beta, I think it does create a very dynamic and a challenging battlefield. And the war gamer has a lot of choices going down to the formation and the individual unit level. You've also got your leaders at your HQs with the influence they can have through some of their decisions on the battlefield. And you've got the strategic choices that are a hallmark of the decisive campaign series where each turn you're sort of choosing where to put your command focus and how to influence the battlefield there. The end result, and again, I mentioned this earlier, is that it really, really stacks up well when you read the historical accounts of the Battle of the Bulge. And then you play through uh, this game at this scale, you really feel like you're reading some of those historical accounts. So in my opinion, I know a lot of people say, well, there have been a lot of Battle of the Bulge games. You know, this is actually a fresh and new take on the Battle of the Bulge. And I think war gamers who are familiar with the history, uh, if they pick up decisive campaigns or Den's Offensive and play it, they will find, I think, that it makes a, a very credible retelling uh, with all the uh, operational and tactical choices of the Battle of the Bulge. So, Vic. Yeah. I'm going to ask you the million dollar question, I think, for a lot of people, which is what's your best guess at this point on when war gamers will be able to get their hands on decisive campaigns or dense offensive? It needs about a few months more 
months more more work. Uh, I still need to start a serious beta test as well. So I, I my gut feeling is it will probably be middle to end of quarter two, but mm -hmm. take it with a grain of salt because sure to take this development easy if it's it's not ready yet. I'm going to delay a bit. It's ready. It's going to be released. Uh, it's yeah, already we... far. Everything is like functionality wise. Uh, everything is already in there. Uh, the scenarios are almost finished. It's just the interface that needs a bit of a of, of a lift up, uh, and the AI needs a bit of a because it's really good at the moment. But I need to add in some extra uh, long-term algorithms to help it, like in the 64-turn scenario, for example. Mm -hmm. It needs to think a bit more strategically uh, mm -hmm. as well. So it's uh, it's close, but not yet there. Let's uh, let's hope Q2 is going to work. Sure. So I'll late Q2. Best. I mean, that's that's a fair estimate, and we we always bake these until they're done. So it'll come out of the oven when it's done. But that's our best guess right now. Um, and then a last sort of parting words here. Uh, when you look back at all your experiences to date, um, you look at all the games that you've worked on, all the people you've worked with. What words of wisdom or advice would you have for war game developers or designers that may be just now working on or considering whether to start on their first game? I would say, uh, and that sounds maybe a little bit conservative, but after so many years, I would say like, unless you're a genius, uh, you should take a real hard think about how to avoid uh, disaster in development. Uh, so don't think only about the opportunities. Uh, think about what could go wrong. Mm -hmm. And to illustrate this a bit, uh, uh, to, well, to make this advice a bit more practical, I would say, like, if your new game, if it's doing multiple new things you've never done before, mm -hmm. I'd want to scrap those new things until there's only one new thing left. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this way you can be sure you can probably handle it. Uh, in a previous title I never finished, for mm -hmm. example, I tried to move from 2D graphics to 3D graphics, uh, design a whole new uh, strategy game system. And uh, at the same time, I wanted to have a graphic novel in there, which was procedural. and and I did it in a, in a programming language I never used before. And it's like four things. And yeah. it's, you should. That, that's a pretty heavy look right, right there. You should aim on the conservative side. And mm -hmm. if it works with one new thing, you can always add a second at that stage, but mm -hmm. don't do everything at the same time. Be clever and don't work for years and then uh, lose all that time for nothing. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I think those are good words from experience. And I want to say thank you, Vic, for joining us today. Uh, I hope the rest of your 2020 is good. Uh, we'll be hearing more about decisive oh, campaigns so yeah, in our dense offensive. So in 2021, we'll be hearing a lot more about it. Uh, and at this point, I think I and probably safe to say many other war gamers are now looking forward to it. And for those out in their audience who haven't tried Vic's other games, I really strongly encourage you to take a look. I think you'll find them among the most engrossing and the most immersive war games and strategy games that you can get. And as I'll point out one last time, Shadow Empire should be releasing on Steam the day that this is aired. Go take a look at it. Thank you very much, Vic. My pleasure.